So we're going to talk today about some Pyretic, uh, which is a framework that I wrote for reverse engineering in Python at the Python layer. Um, it's normally like about an hour long talk and apparently I've got to do it in 45 so we're going to fly through some stuff. Um, probably not spend so much time on the kind of the understanding of the Python language. I assume if you're here you've at least uh, got some understanding of that. <coughs> so why reverse Python, which is probably a good question to begin with. Uh, most people reverse at C or the assembly layer. Um, I needed to assess the uh, security posture of uh, some closed source Python um, and uh, the people who would wrote that application had gone to some length to try and uh, stop me assessing that security posture. Uh, so obviously it was a personal challenge of uh, uh, I would defeat them. Uh, all the available toolkits uh, really didn't work with anything other than standard compiled Python bytecode. Uh, even the smallest obfuscation uh, would kind of trip them up. Uh, so that was why I decided obviously I had to uh, write some tools to do what I needed to do. Um, most of the kits you know, will assume that all the decompilers and disassemblers just assume that the code that you're dealing with is standard byte code. You know, people won't have gone to any lengths to, uh, to try and stop you reversing it. Um, so there's you know, none of the toolkits apart from this one now has uh, kind of any understanding or uh, attempt to get around any uh, obfuscations which might be in place. Also obviously uh, there's a huge amount of Python code out there um, and a lot of these, you know, the, a lot of it is used in web applications and remote applications so there's a big attack surface area um, to, be, to be working with but there isn't a huge amount of work in actually doing Python specific techniques. Um, so it was, a, you know, it was a good area to, to carry on some research in. Um, and maybe like in the past there actually hasn't needed to be much work in this space because people hadn't been distributing uh, obfuscated Python, they'd just been throwing the PYs out. So you, you know you could, you could read the source code anyway. Um, but this is changing. Uh, there's some general kind of bigger picture trends. Obviously people are moving away from developing in C and C++ for all the reasons that you know, people have failed at it for the last uh, 20, 30 years, found out that it's hard. Obviously the high level languages, Python, Ruby, Lua, etc., etc., much more rapid to develop in. Um, the people that are able to develop in it are a, uh, you know, kind of straight out of university and are able to do Python much better than they are to be able to do C so there's more developers, it's cheaper to develop, it's cross platform, etc., etc. There's also a uh, changing in the distribution. You know, five or six years ago you always download an application. Now it's all web 2.0, uh, the cloud, you know, everything's got something to do with the cloud but nobody knows what, exactly what the cloud is. It's got something to do with the network, the internet. Um, so everything now is uh, you know, software as a service. Um, what this means for reverse engineering obviously is maybe you don't actually have access to the files in which you're trying to reverse because you're uh, dealing with them on a remote server. Also, overflows aren't the only bugs. Um, you know, everyone's obsessed with uh, uh, obviously stack overflows. It went to heap, and people got more and more complicated, and all the protections were put in place um, to work up. You know, a good memory corruption bug now will take some talented guys. Uh, you know, a good six months of solid research. Um, there's definitely a need for that, but the return on investment for those kind of bugs, you know, it's a significant investment. Uh, some of the researchers, obviously, at Immunity, where I work, um, you know. We've got the resources that we can invest six months in a bug, um, but obviously then the sale, the price of that bug has to, to reflect the amount of work that goes in. A lot of people aren't prepared to pay um, for, for, for bugs. Um, Python will have lots of good bugs in it and higher level languages can have lots of good bugs uh, and they're often very much cheaper to find because they just haven't had as much effort put into uh, to the techniques to find those kind of bugs. So it's, it's easy, there's a lot, lot more low hanging fruit. Um, Reverse engineering, a lot of the toolkits are often kind of done in a C centric manner um, with newer reflective languages. Maybe there are some better ways uh, people are kind of stuck in this decompilation mindset. Maybe there are some better ways to go around it. Um, and obviously, lots of the toolkits, certainly anything to do with Python reversing, rel uh, relied the fact that you had access to the file on disk, that you could do kind of a static reverse on the serialized object on disk. Um, if you're working in a, in a service orientated uh, method, that might not be the case. You might not actually have access to the disk, uh, the file on disk, but you do have runtime access to the objects on a remote server. If uh, you can get actually source code back out of that remote object, then obviously that's, hi you know, that's highly desirable, but you're never going to have access to the disk. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And um, bug snobbery. Um, I certainly have fallen into this category. I get, you know, loud and vocal about why am I having to do, you know, do a week's worth of assessment on XSS and uh, CSRF. Um, but to be quite honest, you know, just because you're not working on some hardcore overflow 
Uh, you can get some pretty good bugs. If it gets you in, it gets you in. You, know, you shouldn't be too, uh, too proud to work on an XSS, even though it's in JavaScript and that's what all the kiddies are doing. Um, and there are lots of like, areas with low-hanging fruit um, that haven't really been, uh, had too much research put into them yet. And not everybody is an eco Weissman. Not everybody can do crazy heap reversing. Um, so I, I came to the conclusion that I'd never become as good as Nico, so I had to start looking in other areas to uh, make myself feel good. So other side effects of like the new development model, obviously everything's always in beta. The less experienced developers are developing code that actually is used in products, and uh, time to market and new features are key. So there'll be a lot of new code that's out there that hasn't necessarily been tested as thoroughly as you'd like. Um, and obviously, the flip side of all those points are that there's going to be tons of bugs, and that's what we like. Um, there's often new large populations of users for whatever the, uh, you know, the, the in-app of that week is, and they can often be rapidly seeded. So a huge population of users running some very vulnerable code will burst up, and obviously that's the best thing that you can have. Um, and a lot of these bugs, because it's in the higher level languages, are actually cross-platform and cross-architecture. Now, that's awesome. You write one bug and it will uh, execute across whatever architecture system they're running on and whatever operating system they're running on. So you could hack uh, you know, an iPhone right the way up to a mainframe. If it's running Python and there's a Python level bug, you'll be good, um, which is huge. Um, um, and you know, there's obviously all these conferences, and certainly with Black Hat, you'll get a lot of vendors like peddling uh, huge, huge amounts of snake oil. You know that we're more secure than we've ever been. But I really think it depends on what metrics you're measuring on. Uh, there's more lines of code than there's ever been. Um, there's more people who think they can code. I'm sure there's everyone sitting in here uh, knows people at their place of work who should never be let near a keyboard. Yet they're doing code which is uh, going out. Uh, in production systems or in internal systems. Obviously, everything's in now about connectivity, everything's network aware, um, and you know, the pervasiveness of technology is increasing. So I'm not sure really that we are more secure than ever, and uh, the higher level languages are being used increasingly to, uh, to seed all this crap everywhere. So if we can find some good techniques to exploit them, then we will. Well, it's not going to be discussed. Uh, there's not going to be any dropping of commercial application source code that I've reversed out from anything or any bugs that I found within. Uh, mainly because the lawyers don't seem to uh, agree that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas and I can't afford to be taken to court. So why reversing a high layer? Most people assume that going in uh, to the lowest layer is the best thing, but if, you're, if the, uh, an application has been written in a high level language and reversing it at the layer it's been written means that you're closer to the developer, you're closer to the information, further from the data, well, uh, but closer to the information. So you can get a much better sense of bugs that might be around. Um, you know, we're not assessing the security posture of the Python runtime. That does have a ton of bugs, but we're looking for uh, bugs in the Python code itself. So reversing out the layer that the, uh, the code was implemented in is the best thing to do. I'm not sure how clear this will come out, but uh, you, can, you should be able to see here, there's, uh, this is uh, reversing like in a normal debugger, and you'll see a lot of call outs to kind of uh, the Python DLLs. Even to do something simple, uh, so, you know, like print a hello world, there's actually a lot of uh, layers in between you and the code. So it gets very, very complicated, and even to do simple things can actually make, uh, take quite a lot of effort. <clears throat> and obviously, you know, Python is a fairly complex language. It's got, uh, you know, quirks and flaws and bugs, just like every other language. Um, but like I say, a lot of the people that are developing it are maybe less experienced developers. They don't really understand so much about, uh, you know, how computers work. Um, so there's, there's kind of mistakes that everybody makes. I'm going to just highlight a couple. Um, you know, anybody out there that's good at Python that can see the, 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 the problem with this code? Shout. All right, I won't wait long. There's only one var. Uh, well, yeah, the var is uh, a class rather than an instance attribute. So you can see if uh, you, on foo and bar, which are the instantiations of the test class, if you actually print out the var variable, uh, both of those ins instances of the class share the same variable because the variable is at, uh, at the class layer. People make this mistake all the time. Uh, if they uh, make a new instance of an object on a shared system, you can actually get access, uh, depending how they use the, the class obviously, you can get access to uh, other people's objects which depending on the situation can be a good thing. Anybody can see the problem in this? Okay. It's a mutable default argument here. So when it was called uh, here with an argument going in, we're all good. It acts as, uh, as you know, a foo is appended to the end of the list that was supplied. That's as expected. 
if, if it's called uh, without an argument, the default argument's used, but the default argument is uh, made in instantiation time. Uh, so again, it's shared. So the, you call it twice and the list is growing. Um, I've seen a lot of people make this mistake. Uh, certainly in remote applications, they'll have socket objects here. It means you can access somebody else's socket object and then uh, you, you've got to route back to a different client. Um, so obviously, like every language, there's a ton of these bugs that maybe inexperienced developers don't really understand because they don't understand uh, really how Python's doing things. It's just a fairly easy language to write in. Uh, so lots of people make some pretty simple mistakes. So what were my initial aims for, for doing this? I wanted to be able to have a toolkit that would rapidly uh, assess and find bugs within uh, applications. Uh, even if they were obfuscated and I didn't have access to the, to the .pys uh, themselves. Obviously I wanted to get back to a source code representation from uh, you know, a live memory object and I'd prefer to have a general approach against all the ways that people are obfuscating bytecode rather than a specific approach for each different thing because obviously that's a cat and mouse game and it's going to take a lot of time to carry on. So if there was a general way of defeating what people were doing um, then I wanted to take that. Obviously there was because I'm giving this talk. So we're going to blast through this because we haven't got much time. Uh, like 101 uh, of Python language. Uh, so obviously there's a fair amount of different file types with Python. The PY is the one that everyone will be familiar with. It's where the source code lives. It's human readable. Uh, obviously you can take that PY. It will run on any uh, Python platform. Uh, then there's uh, kind of the compiled and serialized versions of, uh, of the Python languages, PYC being the, uh, you know, the kind of most ubiquitous one. It's a standard serialized form. We'll have a look at the format very quickly. Um, anytime uh, Py is compiled or, or imported, uh, import obviously implicitly compiles, uh, a PYC will pop out uh, of the, uh, a, a, a PYC will pop out uh, which is the, you know, the bytecode equivalent of the PY. Um, contrary to popular belief, it doesn't actually speed up execution. It purely speeds, speeds up instantiation uh, because you miss out that compile step. So you don't need to recompile every time you run the application. It is cross-platform. A PYC will run on you know, Linux and Windows, um, but it's not cross-Python version. So a 2.4 PYC won't run with a 2.5 runtime. Um, and it is purposely document, undocumented by the Python developers to allow them the flexibility to change the bytecode format without breaking a bunch of stuff where people have relied on it. PYOs, same structure as PYCs, but they're uh, optimized at some point. You can optimize at the first level, which will remove all the asserts. Optimize at the second level, it will remove all the asserts and all the inline documentation. Uh, nothing to do with speed, purely file size. Um, this shouldn't break most things, but in some kind of corner cases it will. Python, Lex, and Yak is one of those that uh, if you remove the doc strings, then everything fails because the, uh, the actual Lex grammars are kept in the doc strings. Um, but most of the time a PYO, just smaller file size, so that's all good. PYD, uh, the most complex format that Python will produce um, by itself. Uh, the, it comes as standard with CPython. Uh, I've seen a lot on Windows. It will compile into uh, in, you know, a shared compiled C object. Um, we're not really going to talk about these. There's been some good work done by uh, Aaron Portnoy and Ali, Ali uh, and they can access the PYDs and uh, they did a, a toolkit called Antifreeze where you can uh, unpack the PYDs, modify the bytecode, repack them. Um, they did some good stuff uh, uh, with, with games on Windows making that character jump like 20 times higher. So the Python uh, PYC format, there's a four byte magic number. Um, this is for the version of Python. Uh, like I say, to make sure, the, so the runtime can do a check of what version the, uh, the Python was compiled with and bail out if it's not the version that it is. There's a four byte timestamp. Um, we'll show why this is important later. Basically, it's to decide whether uh, a new PYC should be generated from a PY. And uh, there's uh, a marshaled code object, which is the actual serialized code object uh, where the Python code resides. You want to say something? <sighs> well, we made it to 2 o'clock this afternoon until I had to come and yell at you. Several someones are stiffing Katie's who have been very nice to us for $100 plus bills. As in seven people eat, get up, walk out, leave the bill. Very, very uncool. Let's apply that whole new social media thing or whatever you guys are calling it. If you know who they are, pressure them to go pay their bill. If you know who you are, go pay your bill. If you're thinking about doing it, don't. The, the number's risen enough now that I'm coming over here to make an announcement about it, so it's not just one group. If it keeps happening, you will be 
They will review the videotapes. They will catch.